we are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P Car Talk. Welcome to another episode of P-Car Talk. I'm Mike. And I'm Aaron. And we're at the Brumos Collection with our special guest, Don Leatherwood. Thank you for being on the show. You Thank are you. a legend. Yeah. We are honored to have you on. You have so much race knowledge and history, and we can't wait to pull some of it out of you yep. today. Um, so, so, you know, long, long career, like a long background in, in Porsche and racing. And like you said, you worked at Porsche as a master mechanic and, you know, electrician and all those things. And Let's start from the beginning because we have a lot of listeners that maybe don't know, which they should, but we'll give them an education about Brumos and like your background and how that came to be and where you started with Porsche and how you progressed into Porsche and racing with Brumos and how did you get on the team and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm pretty old, so it was a long time ago. (laughs) You don't have to date the dates, but (laughs) yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I was in the service, and I was a guidance section technician, uh, Nike Hercules. Okay. Uh, we ended what branch? Up with Army. Okay. Nice. And, uh, Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah. Thank, man, thank you. But we, uh, this is early 70s. I thought I'd end up in Vietnam, but I ended up in northern Italy. And, uh, <laughs> that's a that's nice a, trade-off. A it, was, uh, it was great. And uh, uh, being a motorcycle buff, I got the best motorcycles in uh I ended up kind of uh, slipping one past the goalie and did the honorable thing, and it was 44 <laughs> years ago. So, uh, so it kind of worked out then. Yeah, yeah having okay. a wife I've got, she's, uh, she likes motorcycles and she likes sports cars. So That, that worked out. Good. Well, if she's Italian, yeah. that's probably yeah. – it's, it's in her DNA, right? It is in her DNA. It's exactly <laughs> right. But uh, uh, once I got back, there wasn't a lot of jobs available for uh, guidance section technicians. Uh, Imagine that. Huh? I got a. I went to work at an insurance company. My dad had sold insurance for Liberty National, and I got his old debit. My mother was so thrilled, and uh, I ran into an old friend of mine that we used to race motorcycles together, and he was at Porsche or at uh, at working at a brand new dealership in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's where I'm from. Okay. Knoxville. okay. And uh, Rogers Cadillac had bought the Porsche dealer's franchise, and he's. I said Porsche. He says, it's a big motorcycle. It's just a big air cool. You, you, yeah. So I quit the insurance business, and we started going to school to, to get an allocation of cars. They had to train a bunch of people. And our schools were in Jacksonville Okay. at the old okay. Volkswagen outfit over off Liberty Street. And uh, Don Hawkins and, uh, and uh, Willie Porter and some of the old, oh, some of the old guys would remember those, those instructors. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, uh, it was, it was kind of, I remember I used to come to Jacksville and I used to think, God, that city stinks. <laughs> and they had a uh, paper bill here. Oh, and yeah, it yeah, literally yeah. stunk. Yeah. And, uh, oh, well, once you go across the bridge, you get over towards the beach. I said, cross the bridge. And I'd been down here several weeks. Uh-huh. Wait, uh, beach? Uh, bridge. <laughs> and uh, so the next time I crossed the bridge and went to the beach and, wow, that's mm-hmm. not too bad. And when I did, I passed the Brumos. I saw the red, white, and blue. I think it was a 934. It was sitting in the front Ooh, window on the okay. showroom floor. Yeah, that's eye-catching. And it's like, wow, I, I remember that. Because it was kind of a, you know, it was a famous livery. Mm-hmm. And it was American and uh, Haywood. I remember Haywood because yeah. Leatherwood and Haywood. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, uh, a long story short, I ended up, I, I won this uh, southern, in our region, you take these little, tests, uh, mechanic challenge oh. tests, and, okay. and I happened to, to win that, and you got to be like an honor, honorary pit crew member, okay. and Al Holbert gives you a little plaque, and you're... Nice. So I end up at Daytona, it's 1979, and I thought I was going to get to work on Al Holbert's team, and I get there, yeah. and the guy says, oh, well, we got plenty of people, but you're going to work on this team, and I went over there, here's this big, long-haired guy sitting up against the 935, a, a black car. Well, it was Ted Fields. Oh. I had no idea, yeah. but it was okay. Ted Fields. And then I went, oh, that's Danny and guys, because mm-hmm. I kind of kept up with IndyCar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, then the other one was Hurley Haywood, and I said, hey, well, that's the guy with the red, white You're like, car. You're like, I recognize that car. Yeah, I recognize and, that name. But uh, anyway, my job was to drive the Taylor Dunn. So I drove at Taylor Dunn. We, we got in it. It was kind of crowded on a Saturday morning. You know how it is yeah. in Daytona on a yeah, Saturday exactly. morning. Get, and I made it down to Goodyear, and he says, well, you're trained. That's good enough. You didn't run over anybody. <laughs> so we loaded it with tires. The good old days, Took right? it back to the pits. <laughs> yeah, and probably 30 trips back and forth during the night. Come the next morning, 
we're, we're, we could win. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, Hurley won that race. Uh, Hurley and Danny and Goss and Ted Fields in the, uh, that's awesome. the black Interscope car. That's and, uh, and that's your first experience exactly. with it. It's like, oh, man, and where do you Hurley go from goes, there? Tampa, you need to come up. So I come up to Jacksonville, and I figure I could go to J.U., G.I. Bill, mm-hmm. and, uh, and go to work at Brumos. Sounds like an and, awesome uh, plan yeah, to me. Yeah, hey, and I talked to Siggy Marlin, who was the a legend. He was the 42nd employee at the Porsche factory. He made Brumos. He was the, you know, Siggy Marlin. has been there forever. I recognize him. Yeah, and yeah. if you go in here, you'll see him on the pictures, a few of them. He was back with Brundage days, and he came over here. He was the manager of the transmission department in, at, in Germany, and he came over with the Spiders, and Hubert Brundage got a hold of him, and yeah. he was... But anyway, he, he hired me, and I needed an electrician. That's good. And this was like 80, and it was the proliferation of electronics had kind of started yeah. getting into yeah. cars. So, um, that makes sense. It's it, almost kind of one of those things. It's like nobody else wanted to learn it, but they wanted to find the guy who knew it. Well, And it was like, you're the guy who knows it. Don't tell me about it. I don't want to know about it. You figure it out. Yeah. You're the guy. Yeah. <laughs> no escaping it. I mean, it was, it was funny. I remember one day... Uh, I had a Sportomatics, first Sportomatic I'd ever seen, and I did a service on it, and I drove it down the road, and I come back, and I'm crawling underneath it, looking, and Siggy comes over and says, what's the matter? Uh, it, it don't shift. Just get in the car. <laughs> so we're heading down Lee Road. That was over out, off Atlantic Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And when I shifted, sure enough, I didn't take my hand off the shifter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they got these little micro switches that tell that clutch, the diaphragm, to pull the clutch in. And he knocked my hand off the shifter, and it shifted into second gear. <laughs> so we go back, and he brings the book down. And he says, you read this, and tomorrow morning, you're going to tell me how it works. Okay. Well, uh, we did a lot of sportomatics around Florida for uh-huh. that. And then most yeah. of it was, I mean, it's basically like a 901 manual gearbox, but mm-hmm. it's just basically a vacuum-operated yeah. clutch. And, I didn't uh, know that. It, 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 it knew your hand was still on that thing. Yes, it has little that. micro switches, and they feel it when you shift, and they tell it to, it's like... That's uh, crazy. Nowadays, we have strain <laughs> gauges, you just, you, know, you just educated me. I didn't know but, that. Um, that was the majority of the problems with Sportomatics was micro switches out of adjustment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I ended up staying at Brumos, and uh, uh, Bob Snodgrass was just a great guy to work for and be around. And, yeah. Uh, we love Bob. He, Bob's such an awesome guy. He was, and, and then Hurley, that's about the time Hurley was doing some IndyCar stuff, and then he hurt his leg. That's I remember that, to, yeah, when he had that bad wreck, and he had that, like that, and he was out of racing for a little while because of that. Well, yeah, he drove a Jaguar with Tulius for a while, a 44 I do remember car, that. Yeah, because yeah. it was a Hewlin box, yeah. and he didn't need to clutch other yeah. than yeah. leaving the pit. So he yeah. drove, a Porsche gave him their uh, praise and yeah. said, you know, go ahead. And uh, so Hurley did that for a few years until he got back into the. Uh, to the Porsches, yeah. but uh, I guess his next big deal was when, uh, well, when Dan Davis bought the company in 89, kind of a prerequisite, we we're going back racing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Which is awesome. Yes. I'm sure you were happy to hear oh, that. Like, you're was, like, <laughs> yes! Well, we worked for Dennis Saucy. We did the Roar thing. We did uh, Tim Ralston's little car. So, but uh, Dennis Saucy was an awesome guy to work for. And Bob would always let some of his Brumos crew guys go out and do that when mm-hmm. we weren't racing yeah. ourselves. And, uh, Which is great. I mean, But when it, it came back, so we got the supercar. We got the one that Dave Murray and Hurley did in the one lap. Remember when they started the one lap yeah, around yeah. America? And uh, they'd stop at racetracks and run this mm-hmm. car. So Porsche says, you take that car. And it was like a maroon car. We basically painted it white. Yeah. And uh, that was a fun time. I mean, taking a street car, and it kind of had to remain a street car. Uh-huh. We ended. We showed up at the first race. Well, the reason we this happened, we're at Savannah testing, and Albert Springer's there, and Hurley leaves out of the pits. We're doing some adjustment, and there's some water on the ground, and and uh, Alwyn Springer says, about that time, Jim Bailey comes on the radio. Hurley, do you have the AC on? <laughs> Hurley, says, well, it's hot. So Hurley's out there that testing. So He's got the AC. Yes, it is so Hurley. That's exactly. so Hurley. But uh, so when we showed <laughs> like up in said. Miami with it, we took the compressor and everything off. 
<laughs> just so we could. So they that come again. in and they says, "Where's your AC compressor?" Well, oh, so we had to rob one off another car, really, and put it on the, because you had to have it on. You had to have a car uh, okay. AC compressor on there. And, oh, jeez. Uh, so the next race, we had an AC like, see? compressor. See, <laughs> I'm, with, I'm with Hurley on that. I like AC. Yeah, well, I think the next race, the compressor was just a pulley at that point. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, For show. Sure. Uh, anyway, we it's had, hot. Uh, it's a race car, whatever. And it was just great having the red, white, and blue car back on the track. Yeah. Uh, we had competition at the console ears. I remember coming back to Miami and said, what the hell is a console ear? Yeah. And it was, it was, what is that? It was, looked like the box it came in. It wasn't a very attractive car, but uh-huh. it was, uh, it was a, a local built car and it was pretty quick. Hmm. And, uh, then of course you had Doc Bundy in the, uh, Lotuses. Yeah. And they run that Garrett turbocharger about this big around. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it looked like a pool, pool floaty in there, like it's so big. But uh, it was a good chance for Hurley to get back out. He won the championship in 91. Uh, in 91, he won the driver and the manufacturer's championship. In 92, we just won the manufacturer's championship. Doc Bundy won the mm-hmm. driver's championship. And in 93, uh, Hans Stuck had driven with us a few times before. And your job was to take care of Hurley. You know, yeah. We had Walter Rule and Hans Stuck and, yeah. and uh, Joe Vardy and... Uh, Bobby Carradine and uh, even uh, Chuck Knowles was assistant secretary of the interior back then. That's insane. Uh, he drove with us a couple of times. but um, That's pretty cool, though. They would drive the 58 car. Okay. But the last year, Hans was going to come back and drive the 58 full time. Mm. He's not going to mm-hmm. win. Yes, you can win. <laughs> and uh, he did a lot of it. Yeah, a lot of wins. Uh, and, uh, of course, we brought Colucci in. We always brought Mike Colucci in. It mm-hmm. seems like when we wanted to get serious. And uh, he ran that car, and I got to work with him a lot. So working with Hans was – you were pretty much hooked at that time. And yeah. Norbert Singer would come around and roll in Coosball because that car kind of turned in in 94 it turned into the LM car. You know, they put a flat fan in the back mm-hmm. and, uh, and ran it. And we uh, we won the championship at Watkins Glen. Hurley came back from Le Mans after winning in uh, '94. Yeah. In the last 962, the uh, Dower car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, a week later, he comes to Le- uh, Watkins Glen, and him and Hans win the GT championship in That's that insane. that Brumos car. So, uh, what was uh, it like when? Like when Hurley started, like when he was racing with Peter, and like he made that like leap to start racing prototypes, and then Peter really wasn't racing prototypes. What was that time like at Brumos? Like, was would would Hurley go race some of that stuff and then come back and like do some other racing with you guys? And like, was he kind of like back and forth? Like, how did that go? Well, like he that? was always there, uh-huh. but he did have some different interests when it come to some of the race. I mean, Peter was kind of finding himself there towards the, towards the end. Uh-huh. Uh, 77. To me, that's the year that made Hurley Haywood. Yeah. Uh, he wins Daytona in the last normally aspirated air-cooled car to win that race, the yeah. 43 car. Exactly. Uh, S-Cargo, the, the, the <laughs> snail, they call it. Yeah. The uh, team <laughs> snail. And, uh, and it was quite a feat. He drove the car uh, – for a, uh, like an eight-hour period that night. They got out of the That's car insane. once. insane. We put a blanket up. He went behind it, and they changed his helmet. Stuff you and, never hear about nowadays, right? Oh, like, well, now you've got yeah, driver ID and yeah, all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think IMSA probably knew it. Yeah. But as long as he was doing good out there, they weren't going to say anything. Yeah. But uh, he wins that race and then goes to Le Mans and gets put in the car with Jackie Ix in the 936 and wins at I Le Mans. Know. Let me tell you, if you do, that doesn't write your ticket. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say rock star for uh, legend, right? Like instantly. And uh, so, but he always kept his uh, roots at Brumo. Okay. So that was a good thing. I mean, he didn't like run up. He did the uh, Audi thing for a bit. Him and Hans Stuck did the uh, Quattros in 88. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I remember you said he could just pretty much drive anything too, Hurley, like wounded car. <laughs> it yes, didn't matter. he was so good. But he didn't, he didn't really know. I remember the Roar car. We're going to get back to the Roar car We. We're practicing, and I put a right front strut on it, and I think John Wright, some of the, one of the kids that's a crew chief now, did the other front tire, and uh, he goes out a lap or two, and Hurley comes on the radio and says, something messed, I can't drive this car, something's wrong with the front of him. So we're 
stomachs up in her mouth. We're thinking, well, what did we do? Mm -hmm. So the car comes in the pits, and I look over there, and I'm looking at my stuff. All looks good. And I look over the fender, and it's all looking. Everything's yeah. good. I hear Jim Bailey come on the radio. Hurley, your left rear tire is gone. <laughs> What do you mean it's gone? It's gone. You've got sidewalls, that's all. So they put a tire on it. Hurley goes out a couple laps, kind of comes on the radio. And says, I guess that got it, guys. <laughs> but, uh, that's but hey, it feels a lot better now. You know, I'm going to tell you, I think in all racing, and especially with Brumos, this is a kind of a key. If you've got a guy that's really, he really looks at the data, and he's really... Uh, it could qualify the car and he's he's just really into it like peter Gregg was mm -hmm. and then you put a seat of the pants guy you gotta have them both yeah we had it with david donahue and darren Law. yeah good pairing right we had it with uh with andrew davis and lee king yeah and you put a real methodical guy in the car that thinks about everything and then he he qualifies the car really well, and then when the first stint is over, he gives you a car in a good position yeah. on the lead lap. Exactly. And then you put a guy in there that... Then you get your hot rod in there. in there. Yeah, you get your hot rod in there. It's like, dude, I'll drive this thing till it blows up. And that was Lee. <laughs> and, uh, or Hans. Yeah. Or, uh, well, Darren was just... He was just a great driver, but uh, him and Donahue was a tremendous yeah. pair. Lee's an awesome driver. He's still fast. Oh yeah, yeah. He's a rocket, yeah. and he he's, he loves a loose car. Mm -hmm. So you know, he I think he'd make a good rally driver. Oh yeah, but I uh, think he would have been fantastic at it. I mean, he's building those off the safari cars yeah, now, is. and he's just yeah. he's loving it. Uh, he brought he took our safari car out on the property out here. Mm -hmm. There was one spot he was doing a hundred and five mile an hour <laughs> in the dirt. It was, just flying. Brrr. So they went over to trying to find a place that he could get air, uh -huh. and. Uh, I think he got air, but I think we towed the car back. He didn't hurt it, but I think uh, it ended up with a problem. That sounds likely. Uh, uh, the guys up Goldcrest, it, it, you know, we did the Daytona prototypes for a long time. That mm -hmm. started 2002. We found out about it. We went to Dave Clem's, which we'd known a long time. Dave Clem's fabulous at Fab Car. And basically built the first Daytona prototype. Mm -hmm. and uh, And that was... Well, that's not a Porsche. It was pretty cool program. Let's face it; it lasted a long time. It, it did. kept the interest of road racing alive in America. I, you I, like the Daytona I, program, I agree. Not? I totally agree because everybody was longing for something fresh, right? And right. that's what yep. it was. And um, it it was supposed to be a program that you could run these prototypes and not spend so much money, but just like all racing. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's slippery, I remember we started slope, out right? an electric. Start out with weather packs. I mean, NASCAR steers. It's a good electrical connector. Yeah. Works with water. Then they oh well, we got to use meal spec connectors. You know, <laughs> oh well, we'll use the auto sport connectors. And it just kept getting. More exactly. and yeah. more expensive, but uh, I next, thought this was supposed to be affordable. This it's, is bankrupting me now, <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. Uh, but the the it, it, the series went really good, and we did a fab car for a good while, and then of course ever the Riley chassis was what everybody was using. We ended up going to the Riley chassis, and it's funny. The reason we ran a six cylinder was because of Bob. Okay, you know we were a Lexus dealer at that time, and we could have uh, uh -huh. very well ran a Lexus V8. Yeah. Uh -huh. And TRD was really behind the program, and uh, well, Ganassi had big success mm -hmm. running a Lexus. But Bob says, "No, we're going to run a Porsche. We're Brumos, and we're going to run a Porsche. Nice. And you don't have anything other than a six cylinder, so that's what we're going to run." So. Mm -hmm. They had to make some changes. We got a different RPM than they got, but we're all governed about 530 horsepower, okay. something like that. And so these, I remember one of them is powered up BMW. I think they ran a whole season without pulling the heads. I mean, they're running these things at such low horsepower yeah. for what the yeah. car can I was going to say, do. yeah, it's like basically dialed so far down. It's exactly. like, it's fine. It's fine, exactly. But um, we ran our cars a little harder. The, the, and they were basically <laughs> GT3 no. R motors. And, uh, <laughs> you guys know. And it was, uh, it was a, a fun program. Uh, it got to the end. We wanted to run a V8. And uh, we found a Cayenne motor. Okay. Uh, Zano Brothers took it over and kind of converted it. And, uh, and that, was gonna, that was our last year running Daytona prototypes. Mm -hmm. And it won. With the Cayenne we, motor. Yeah, one with the Cayenne nice. motors. We won in So 09. you hear it, guys. Cayenne motor. Yeah. Done. We did good. <laughs> uh, but, 
you know, that still, because Porsche was not going to let us run a V8. They said not to. Yeah. You know, we're a dealer. Yeah. And you know, that was 58 and 59. Well, that race, that car became the number nine car oh. and had Action Express on it and had the German colors. Uh-huh. And then we ran the 59 the way it was. Okay. In 10, 2010. Got it. And that was the reason. It would have still been the 59 car, mm-hmm. but since it had a motor in there that Porsche did not want in the yeah. car. That's crazy. Talk about that a little bit because they still had, even though you were a dealer and you guys were basically, I mean, you had Porsche's blessing, so to speak, but you guys were racing under your own accord, under your own dollars, whoever was owning the businesses at that time. But yet they were still okay in things that you could and couldn't do from a racing standpoint. That's kind of nuts, right? Like you guys had to make sure that you guys were okay in the blessing of the mothership essentially right that's exactly right i mean uh it, obviously this this cayenne motor worked out pretty good you mm-hmm. would yeah. think that but we had to kind of follow their yeah. direction and dan davis probably did the smart thing he says look you know let's just run a gt car go back to our roots mm-hmm. race what we sell yeah and uh so 2011 we went back to gt racing and uh you think, well, you're going down a class. It was harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually got the guys, uh, Bob Sanderson and Cosgrove and the guys from uh, Goldcrest to help us out. Yeah. And uh, because they'd been GT racing and, and very successful and, and they run the first three races with us. And yeah. it was, it was a godsend for us to mm-hmm. be honest with you. But why was it so difficult? Was it because everybody was so like, I guess, up, like tight, like it they was, were so tight with everything. Exactly. It's just a different world. There's things you could end up doing with prototypes that you just couldn't do to okay. this factory car. Yeah. So and, your limitations uh, were like kind of handcuffing you essentially. Plus we, we just didn't have the experience. To mm-hmm. do that. And uh, there was a lot of retooling. There was a lot of factory tools you yeah. got to do to set these cars up. So you had and, to do a lot of relearning essentially. Exactly. Huh? I mean, racing is the same, Yeah. but, uh, prepare that but setting car the car up, right? Everything in between that. Yeah. yeah, it's a new car to you. You had to set it up proper. There's a way to set it. Up. Okay, that makes sense. Well, we brought uh, Skip Shinsing in, and he he knew a lot of people, and we gathered some guys together. At this was kind of towards the last of the Goldcrest involvement. <laughs> Lo and behold, we get to the last race of the year. We're doing good in the championship. I think we were like third in points, and we go out to qualify that morning, and the car doesn't run. No. So it's, it's one like o'clock in the morning, the <laughs> night before the race, we find the problem with the car. We get it fixed, not knowing that it was going to really run because mm-hmm. uh, we're going out the next day to race. We can't run it again. And uh, we had to start it to back. Yeah. Because and, you uh, had a- Andrew brought the car up to like fourth in his stint. Wow. And uh, we came into the pits with, uh, well, the Camaro should have won the Stevenson car. Mm-hmm. And uh, they went off track, tore the car up bad enough that they couldn't finish. Oh, so now wow. So they got a DNF, huh? Us and the Mazda. Nice. Okay. And uh, I tell you, I don't think that Mazda would have got around Lee Keen. If it did, there would have been a lot of black paint on that. <laughs> I'm telling you. But, uh, that doesn't surprise me one bit. <laughs> Lee did a phenomenal job, and we just Not happening. That's it. <laughs> Make that car 10, 10 wide. <laughs> oh, we were at Watkins Glen once, and Doc Bundy, it's a supercar days, and Doc Bundy was asking Walter Rule if uh, he wasn't really blocking, were you? And Walter said, no, I was not. I was a driving chicane. <laughs> <laughs> nice. but, uh, and, you know, that was kind of Brumos's key to a lot of their victories. They got real drivers. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, you think about the history. You, you named off some of the some of the history of the legends that it raced for Brumos. Like all of the guys, they were there was a good balance. I think it was a, a great selection, right? You have a very analytical guy like Peter Perfect, right? You want everything to be right, the cars to be perfect, and then you got a guy like Hurley. It's just like, give me a shopping cart. If the tires last, I'll drive it around the track all night. Like whatever, whatever it takes. That's perfect, and yeah. that's exactly what it was. I yeah. mean, uh, the two were. I really just do whatever it took when he got in the car. Uh, you know, I think when they first met, uh, 
Hurley kind of spanked Peter at a little autocross. At yeah, his Corvette. I remember the <laughs> and, hearing uh, about that. Yeah, and, and like Peter approached him and was like, "Hey, you got to be good to beat me." You yeah, because he's total still, like. Well, I mean, everybody knows Peter was arrogant, right? Eric, Peter was the best. If if he wasn't the best, and if there was somebody who actually beat him, and that guy had to be great yeah. if you beat Peter. Like that's just basically what it was. And Peter was fast, so. It, that and Hurley's fast too, so he was right by assessing Hurley to say you are fast because you beat me. Oh yeah, well I think he just and he didn't know why, mm-hmm. and I think Peter saw that. But Peter then knew that's what you need. You need a guy like Peter because mm-hmm. he was the teams. He used to get the mechanics and stand them in a row and check their uniforms. Really? He had that. You know, in race, almost like open ranks, like in military. <laughs> you know, he he. You know, the number 59 was because it was on the four Uniform's stall. not starched. That's it. You know, collar's ten, not right, or you've got too ten many push ups. <laughs> he wouldn't like me having his button undone here, probably. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but he brought a lot of the kind of regiment you have in the military yeah. to racing. Uh, well, I mean, you think about it like, and you've been around it a long time, there's, there's all types of teams, right? There's teams that are got the guys that go out and, you know, just get hammered drunk and and it, it can reflect you know if you want to win you really do and it and it kind of goes if you think about it to porsche's ethos too like as a company they're very regimented they know what they want to do and they're very perfectionate about what they do when they do it mm. so it actually it makes sense that it kind of translated to peter too where you know him being involved with, as a porsche dealership and having that involvement and like adopting that and being have that personality it makes sense why he married with porsche so well i think that was bob's biggest thing too bob adored peter mm-hmm. uh i don't know about adored, but he he was a kind of an idol of his. yeah and uh he was towards peter kind of the same way i was with bob yeah and uh but let's talk about peter, bob a little bit yeah when down. peter passed bob uh, they kind of thought that Bob should take over the reins of the general manager because he he already had a rapport with Porsche being the sales manager. Yeah. For one. And uh, so it, it really worked out good. And then Deborah kind of found herself mm-hmm. and uh, and she she was pretty successful racing. I yeah. always I thought yeah. Deborah was great. She yeah, was, absolutely. Uh, uh, but so uh, like when Bob, like I, I like the story that we like we we talked about off off record a little bit um when Bob kind of like came into the trailer the first time and was like you guys were introduced to Bob can you just kind of take us through all of that when your first kind of encounter with him and was like because Bob's a, a character obviously he's a big dude and he was just a lot of presence and is how was that like when you first met him you were like okay how's this gonna go <laughs> Bob was uh a little bit intimidating, I suppose. Uh, it's a funny story. The first time I, I had met Bob, but I mean the first time that I really realized that this guy was a little different. Mm-hmm. We were at the shop, and uh, it was about lunchtime, and all these suits were there, and they were waiting on Bob to go out to dinner or lunch. And Bob shows up, walks right past them, and goes over to the F&I guy, and he goes, there's a kid over at Mercedes that wants to buy a car on the lot. He's having a hard time. Make sure he gets that car. And then he turned around and he's Bob yeah. the, with all these guys. And I'm thinking, he came in there, bypassed all these guys, and went right over, and he's going to make sure one of these mechanics over at Mercedes that wanted a certain car out uh-huh. there got it. That's awesome. And I'm thinking That just myself, shows you what kind of character he exactly. is, Exactly. Right? And uh, I'm thinking, this guy... But, uh, yeah, Bob was a little different. <laughs> he had an E500 Mercedes, and we used to, you know, they started off in second gear, but there was some modifications you could do when they started <laughs> off in course. first gear. <laughs> and Bob would come out, and right before he'd leave, he'd leave Mercedes and loop around Porsche so he could drop by the front of the Porsche store. <laughs> and he would stop there and just light them up. <laughs> and I remember this little guy. Oh, I, I wonder where Harris gets yeah, it from. Exactly. <laughs> Harris, just like his dad. And like you said, the older he gets, the more he looks like him. Yeah. But, uh, that's awesome. That he's lighting it up, doing a burnout out in front. Oh, that's Bob. This guy says, well, I heard the owner could really get I said, well, 
that's who that is. Yeah, you you're like, to worry. That, that is the owner, so whatever. <laughs> it's okay. Bob was so great. He's allowed to do and it. And he would get to laughing sometimes, and he couldn't hardly breathe. <laughs> and we would think, I mean, this guy, yeah. but... Uh, He's going to keel over. And he had a passion for motorcycles. That's probably my passion as well. Okay. So we really... So you guys bonded there. over motorcycles then? We'd go to Bike Week every year. Nice. Bill France would give him his motorhome spot right at the old tunnel in really? Daytona, right where security used to be. So yeah. he was the first but his motorhome was right at the tunnel and Bob would bring all his bikes. The money spot, huh? There. Oh, yeah, it was great. He, I don't think he left it. Yeah. <laughs> He'd get a different bike out of the put around a little <laughs> bit course. and come back and sit in there. But he did that every week and it was a big thing for him. And uh, So Daytona was it was uh, kind of a sanctuary yeah. for Bob. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. He did a lot of HSR and amateur racing, you were saying, yeah. too, right? Very like, good driver. He, yeah. uh, he used to think that if he was a second slower than Hurley at a perf- a mile, uh-huh. so like two and a half mile track, he was two and a half seconds slower, he, he felt like he was he was doing good. Yeah, that's and, awesome. And uh, he, was a, he was a very good amateur driver. I mean, uh, and there were a lot of them, Bretzel, uh, <laughs> Dave White. There was a lot of good drivers out there, but... Uh, uh, yeah, Bob was good. And he had a little Chevron uh-huh. that uh, that's where he really got kind of serious. And, uh, of course, it was Mazda-powered. Mm-hmm. Well, Mazda's a fabulous road race engine, but it lacks one thing. There's no engine brake. Mm. So when you're downshifting, it's not like a Porsche or a, most any car yeah. that you can. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just going to yeah, be some all speed over the brakes. Yeah. And, uh I can remember Bob having a hard time with that. Well, we go to the first driver school. This is back in 1985. And we started this, our, our little driver school. It went for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it was a Savannah. And uh, we, we go up and Bob puts me in his Chevron. And he told me he was going to spin me before the weekend was out. But <laughs> he thought that would be in a 944, not the Chevron. But he drops a wheel off about turn three over there, and here oh, we go. Oh, <laughs> no. But I, I'm going to tell you, that that was the first time I went to, you know, I lived in Italy and you know, East Tennessee. I can drive. That. I got to that first driver's school, and I found out I didn't know anything. Yeah. Uh, Bob threw me in the car when we first got there. The, the, the ambulance wasn't even there yet. It's a track really wasn't even open. <laughs> Bob says, get in, get in, get in. He had a 450 SL. Okay. And here we go. And I'm thinking, he, he's not going to make this turn. And I've got a hold of some stuff. And uh, <laughs> he just scrubbed a little speed off and went around the corner. And we didn't go a lap. And I'm going, this guy can drive. You're like, okay. Well, towards the end of the day, I'm in the RSR with Hurley Haywood. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I then I really knew nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the guy's doing a buck 50 at Roebling with his arm out the window, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> so Bored. Uh, and this is middle 80s, but it was... Uh, Bored. Yeah. yeah, we're good. And then brakes. I think it was about the next year in 86, I uh, graduated and I thought, well, you know, AT&T had a field, uh, a field engineer opening. Uh-huh. And I remember Bob says, you, you'll be a number. You've got to stay here. You, you, you'll be a number there. Yeah. And uh, he's right. I listen yeah. to him. Yeah, he's right. Good. He's right for 100%. I mean, it's just great you. water. Yeah, it is good water, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Delicious. Yeah. So, obviously, Bob, if you guys don't know that are listening and watching, he's a very, he was a very tall man and a big man on top of that, too. So, did you guys ever have any problems getting him into any of these cars where you had to like yeah. do these adjustments and like. You got to look at the 914. The last race car Bob had, he, he ended up racing it. Yeah, the one that's back day. at uh, Harris has now. Harris has it now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you look underneath it, uh-huh. we have chopped the floorboard down and there's a <laughs> box that sticks out about two inches. <laughs> And that's just to get his head on the roll bar. And yeah. if you look, there's like an extra little roll bar above the regular roll bar. Okay. All for Big Bob. For Bob, yeah. He Hurley gets in it and he disappears. Yeah, I was about to say, it's like... Yeah. <laughs> we had a pillow for Hurley. <laughs> Do you have my cushion? <laughs> yes, Hurley, we had your cushion. His cushion and his chewing gum. <laughs> we used to always take the... All these drivers have crazy little stuff. 
uh, Roberto Moreno drove one of the 24 hour races with us. And we had a, a fog delay. They were like red flagged in the, in the pits, but they couldn't get out of the car uh -huh. because of the fog and they were waiting. And Moreno comes on the radio and says, uh, so I, I got I got to go pee. Can I go pee? And Bob Snugger says, no, you can't. You got to stay in the car. You can't get out of the car. And he says, well, you need to bring me a bottle down here. So they had those little, remember the little Monte Clay or Monte, the little Monte, whatever, the yeah, little the vitamin small, things, yeah. little bitty bottle. Yeah. And so uh, I got that. I told Bob, I'm Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I run down pit lane and I go out to the car and you I say, here's your old bus. He comes, yeah, you're fine. Your mechanics are real funny, Bob, real funny. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, all this stuff. Max Pappas was a hoot to drive with us. Mm -hmm. uh, just characters. They're yeah. all good. Mar uh, Lucas Lure. Yeah. Uh, Sasha Masha. When he, the, those yeah. guys were just, and the, but they were serious race drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, David Donahue. Yeah. Um, you know, I get people, well, he wasn't Mark. He was pretty he up good. Yeah. David Donahue does a great job. And he could set a car up. He's a real methodical guy. And uh, Scott Goodyear, Scott Sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, they drove the Daytona prototype the first year with us. It was a funny story. We uh, brought the, the Daytona prototype out for the first time. It was like 02, and it was a Continental Historics towards the end of the year. We brought it out, and it was all carbon fiber, and we had 58 on one side and 59 on the numbers. And that night, they were going to drive it, and they had a lot of people there, and the press was there, and Scott Goodyear was going to drive it. And okay. they told Scott that they're going to talk to the people when they come in a little bit, you know, uh -huh. about the car. So don't forget, you're going to be talking, talk up the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, it starts into the pits, and engineer kicks in. Oh, we got issues. We got issues. <laughs> we got some shit in. We got this and that. It's uh, falling apart. Yeah, but we, uh, 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 Scott, we, we're trying. Oh, oh, this is going to be a great car, though. We just got a couple more things. <laughs> it's, it's the best. Like the mid, the mid course correction, where it's like, but we're, it'll be fine. Yeah. It's minor stuff. It's minor yeah. stuff, and we're going to get it squared away, and it's going to exactly. be great. We're, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it really was uh, kind of a trouble free car. I mean, we, we, we ended up, yeah. you know, uh, we used an Emco gearbox. A lot of them use an extract box, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Emco was such a good company and stayed with us the whole time. And uh, we ran Fisky wheels at first. Ah, the Fiskies, yeah, yeah, a beautiful wheel. Yeah, but we ended up, I think, going to uh, BBS just afterwards. But, mm -hmm. uh, but there was there was uh, you, you meet so many neat people at yeah. uh, Ibach when we were running Ibach Springs back. In, you know, they show up yeah. there. there. Eric Buell from uh, you know oh, Buell yeah, Motorcycles. Oh yeah, Buell Motorcycles. Yeah, yeah, he was. He shows up at Elkhart Lake with us. You know, yeah, that's pretty a cool. Guest one time. Yeah, and, uh, but but that's that, pretty that cool because because that's because so. It's Brumos. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. because Brumos carries so much. so much. Like you have all that star power that comes and hangs out and wants to be a part of it. I mean, even more recently when you guys were just re racing not too long ago, uh, Mick Dreamy, right? Patrick Dempsey was with yeah. you guys. With, like, He's a cool guy. Yeah. And, and wanted to race with you guys, and you guys raced at, at uh, 24 hours, right? That's right. that where you raced with you guys at, at Daytona, and it's just, but it, but you know, and like everybody, it maybe you know, and we have, we have listeners all over the world, and maybe they just don't get it, and maybe because we're Florida boys, and we get it, and it's true. But I, I would say probably everybody on the East Coast, at a minimum, like really, really knows Brumos, right? Like out basically east of the Mississippi, Brumos is. For, for the longevity of racing, like, they know what Brumos is. Like, people see that Brumos plate on, you know, on a newer 911 or something, and they see that, and they're like, okay, yeah, that guy knows what's up because he knows Brumos. And, and, and it, I think it always carries that prominence. I think it was one of those dealer race cars, I think, that still to this day is probably the best I, in my mind. I mean, I know I'm biased. We're sitting here with you, obviously, but, like, and you work for them, and you're still part of that program, but... Really, I mean, think about yeah. what they've done in, from such a small thing. I think that's what makes it so cool, where it's not just, okay, it's all this funding and all the, you're just, you know, like some, some factory teams, they just throw money at stuff, you know, mm -hmm. these, and, and of course they're going to eventually win just by the numbers, eventually. Um, but just the longevity and the, and the race history and then what, 
some of the racer, racing guys have done with you guys and outside of Brumos and then have come back to Brumos and back and forth, like speaking of Hurley, like winning Le Mans, doing that stuff. And it's just nuts, like the talent that's come through Brumos. Yeah, that, uh, it's funny when you used to go to service schools, uh, you know, you sit there and they get your name and to get the dealer that you're from. Mm -hmm. And you always, I don't know if you felt different, but I think you were looked upon a little bit different. Yeah. And then somebody would, sometimes people would get there and they would go, well, you know, it's not grandeur. It's, yeah. But after being there a while, they find out it's not that. It's a passion for mm -hmm. the product and yeah. the name. I mean, Bob really took care of his name. Yeah. And, uh, and on top of that, it's the culture that was set with, with Brumos, right? Like everybody who was employed with Brumos, like all had to kind of have that feel, right? Like, and, mm -hmm. and, and it, everybody was into it. It wasn't like some guy, it's like, well, it's just a job. And it's like, everybody wanted to be there, right? Like, so, and I think that's what makes it special too. Like everybody, when you want to be somewhere. You had to, if you didn't yeah. want to be there, you, you'd work there long. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we had a lot of good people that just that didn't like the family and, and they, mm -hmm. you know, or they went out on their own. Yeah, and, and may have just because they had the Brumos name behind them did very well as, uh, uh, also. But uh, I equate I mean, it to like Brumos delivery, was like the Yankees for it, like you know honestly, what? like that's I know good. that sounds really crazy yeah, to say, but yeah. really it is. It's like the they stable? have that legacy yeah. and that like prestige of like when even if you guys have a down year and you're not winning, you're still Brumos, just like the Yankees. If they're not winning, it doesn't matter. They're still the Yankees. Like they walk into the clubhouse and you're like the Yankees are here. It's almost kind of like hey. The Brumos team's here, guys. Well, I you mean, think really. about the livery, that livery. You've got so many iconic liveries, and you've got Martini Rossi. Mm -hmm. You've got Golf. Yep. Uh, you've got, I mean, there's these huge, but they're huge companies. We were exactly. just a little dealership. Exactly. And then and the, the footprint that they was able to leave. Yeah, and them asking you to run it again mm -hmm. yeah. years later. But it's people like Jack Atkinson, uh, Hubert Brundage. Mm -hmm. Peter Gregg, Hurley Haywood, Bob Snodgrass. Yep. Uh, these guys had a passion for the company. I mean, Bob cherished the sweeps. Mm -hmm. And that's what he used to tell you to do, to cherish those sweeps. Yeah. And, uh, you know, remember when Denver had it, and I don't blame her, and I didn't, I kind of liked the sticker, but she changed our logo completely. Mm -hmm. The background where it was white before it was black, mm -hmm. and it had three sweeps, and they were like, kind of a light blue, a peach color, and yeah. a yellow. Yeah, yeah, I kind of remember that. And, uh, and that's kind of the first thing we did when Dan bought the company is mm -hmm. we went, went back to the red, white, and blue in yeah. our tradition. But that's part of our history, that was. It's so iconic. I mean, it's so American, obviously. We're all Americans, and, that, and I think that's another thing, too. Even if you're not... It's relatable. Yeah, if yeah. you're not even into a whole lot of racing, you see the red, white, and blue, and you're like, all right, I don't know anything about racing, but I'm rooting for that car. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I still do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but cool. I mean, it's... And then the just the iconic cars that you guys have raced, too, like all the way from, like, you know, the 935, and, and you have all, you know, you have the RSR, like all your winning cars, all the stuff you have, and it's just, it's, it's just impressive resume. And obviously, it takes time to build a resume. You guys have been in the business for a long time. But, you know, you can be in the business a long time and suck at it, but you guys haven't sucked at it. You <laughs> know, that's true. another thing, too. So <laughs> It's an opposite end of this. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're, we're real fortunate. I mean, uh, Bob had that passion. and kept. I, I look at my tenure at Brumos, and I saw a lot of times that it could have just gone away. Mm -hmm. When Peter died, it could have just gone away. Yeah, it could have went but away, right? Didn't. Yeah. When Deborah sold it, it could have gone away. Mm -hmm. When Bob died, it could have just gone away. Yeah, you're right. There was a lot of, like, tragedy that happened along the way yeah, where there's so many. Control over it. Yeah, it's just a gonna, lot of opportunities for the for the whole situation to just disappear, right? Yeah, well, it, it, when, 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 uh, when Bob died, if a lot of situations, the owner would have had to sell the company to pay off any of their partners. Mm -hmm. But, you know. And we're real fortunate. I mean, we've kept a lot of these cars. It's funny, when we were down on Main Street, gosh, if the Porsche had seen where a lot of these cars were stuffed back in, they would have <laughs> just gone nuts. But then they wanted to build a special place, and it opened in 99, and it was back behind the Mercedes. Yeah, Denver, yeah. And it had, did you ever go into our yeah. old collection? And, um, that was the, I would call that, like, Aaron, uh, Harris and I joke around, that was like the man cave. It was a 
serious man cave. That and was I remember, the, like the man. Everything was like you just said. It was perfect. That's a perfect description. It was stuffed in there, but it was cool because it was just like everything you had was just in there. <laughs> when we first started, there was rhyme or reason to the some of the, it was like the Peter Wall and then the Hurley, then the Bob, and then Dan stuff, and then and mm-hmm. it kind of. But later, it was like, find a place for this and that, yeah. and it was a collage of just yeah. stuff. Can we move this over six more inches, six and then more, move this well, over six inches, yeah. and we can get this in? <laughs> I remember the first car that was in there was the little MG. It was Bob's dad's car when he grew up, the little uh, mm-hmm. uh, 1947 or 48 TC. And uh, I remember Bob's looking over at that one car, and he's looking around, he goes, we'll never fill this place up. <laughs> About a year later, Dan, Dan's like, Bob, you got to quit buying yeah. stuff. <laughs> what are we going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> and then they, they got Buster. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at PCARTalk.com.